So hi, on today's video, I'm going to cover off what I believe is the best 4K gaming monitor above 60 Hertz on the market today. And yes, I am talking about the Gigabit M32U. Now, this might not be the ideal monitor for everybody because it is 32 inches. It is a 16 by nine ratio. However, obviously if you're running something like flight simulation or racing simulation, you might want to look at other alternatives in the ultra wide monitor range because they will potentially feel one being curved most likely and two also being therefore more immersive. However, I'm looking at what I would class as an everyday 4K gaming monitor. Now the remit for me was to have various features. One was to be above 60 Hertz. Two was to enable me to KVM, which this supports. And thirdly was the ability for me to run something like the Xbox Series X on or the PlayStation 5. And in my case, both. So without further ado, let's cover off my review where I'll also cover off the differences between panel types. So whether we cover TN, VA or IPS and what my recommendations would be if you're in the market for a gaming monitor. So stay tuned. So here we have the Gigabit M32U 4K 144 Hz gaming monitor. Now the reason for this purchase is, is that I already own a 32 inch monitor, but that one's currently a quad HD version. So well, not a quad HD, it's really 2K, isn't it? Um, or 1440p. But I wanted to be able to game at 4K at more than 60 hertz. Which I do have a 4K 60 hertz monitor, but I'm told this is the best of the best. So let's put it to the test. Now, the good thing is, is it does come with a really, really bulky stand. However, my final destination for this will not be using stand at all, and it will be on a visa mount on a secret labs arm for my new desk, which we'll cover in a later video. Now the device can tilt and pan, well not tilt so much, or it can tilt, it can pan really well. Now it's actually got a really nice mechanism for moving, that's just, you know, I'm doing very little there to actually move that does height adjust as well to a degree but yeah I mean that's you know obviously from a real estate wise you've got a lot of space there um, and let's talk about the back what connections we've got there so if we have a look at the back what we have is a nice little bezeled area at the top there where you've got you know currently my protected sleeve on it I haven't taken that off yet so a nice little peel to do on the left here a little control nozzle which can enable you to do the bits that you need to do so for all the menu operations if we then look further around the device we've got all our connections at the back here now so if I just come around from the other side we've got two HDMI 2.1s display port which will be at least a 1.4 I'll clarify that a type C USB which is used for the KVM functionality, the super speed USB port and then free USB 3.0 and finally a headphone jack. Now that's not to mention the standard kettle lead connection that you have on the device. But is it any good? That's the question. Well let's do a bit more of an in-depth review. So let's cover off panel types, and primarily there are three. You will hear of others, you will certainly hear of LEDs, so light emitting diode. You will certainly hear of OLED, so again, just a variation of that. And obviously, primarily when you're talking about monitors, you are talking about LCDs or liquid crystal display. Now liquid crystal displays were one of the very first monitors to, or TV devices or screens to go on and replace the really old CRT or cathode ray tubes that we had back in the day where TVs used to weigh about 300 pound and they were massive. So LCD is obviously panels and technology that have come on and primarily you will hear the three terms used which is TN which stands for twisted pneumatic. 
which is basically where the crystals twist to allow light through. They're the very older type and were originally developed as the kind of first replacements for CRTs. The next one would be VA or what they call vertical alignment. And the clue there is on how the crystals work. They are vertically aligned and rotate and twist to again allow lights through. There are variations of them. Samsung have got something that they call SVA, which just stands for super. I don't know what's super about it. And other companies out there have kind of twisted the VA to mean other stuff by just adding more acronyms to the start of them to do that. But they were kind of the next step, I believe, from the TN panel. Now, the best one, in my opinion, is always IPS, and that stands for in-plane switching. And again, that was a term originally coined by LG back in the day, which Samsung put their own technology in, which they call PLS. So again, depends if your actual screen is an LG or Samsung inside on what will actually be referenced on your device. However, IPS panels generally have the best color representation of all of those three monitors. They also have the best viewing angles as well, which I always think is key in devices. Now, when it comes to other winners, TN panels used to have better response times and they were more used to gaming. However, things have changed a lot in the market since those days, and you'll probably find now that some of the best IPS and VA panels can actually outperform TN. So if you, if you are actually looking at a TN panel for any reason whatsoever, please give your head a little bit of a shake and ask yourself the question, why? They will be cheap, but there's a reason why they're cheap, and that's because that technology is really outdated now. Now, should you go for a VA or a IPS? Well, VA is likely to have better contrast ratios, so I would say if you're working in a room where you've got a lot of light reflections or a light, or it can be light and dark room, a VA panel may be the best one for you. However, I would always, always, always recommend an IPS panel, mainly because of one, the colour representation, two, they just seem cleaner to me. When you actually look at the display, they seem to be less strain on your eyes, the way that they work and the kind of colour representation that make them pop more. Now, for me, the big key deliverable with the Gigabit was on the panel type. And I kind of thought when I first saw it, this is most likely to be a VA panel. Was I presently surprised when I found out it was an IPS panel and I was like, yes, I now need to buy this because every panel I buy now is pretty much an IPS. Now, the Gigabit M32U also supports HDR 400, which is an HDR colored standard. Now, it's probably not going to outperform a VA panel from contrast ratio perspective, but I'll be honest, depending upon the lighting of your room and how poppy you want your blacks to be, will really depend on how you kind of understand and work with this monitor. However, I've seen already this actually can represent blacks very, very well. Now, if you want to go for the best kind of color representation and contrast ratios and black levels, you would be looking at an OLED device. But let's be honest, I've not yet seen an OLED monitor that would be cost-effective to run for PC gaming. You could certainly go and buy an LG OLED TV and use it that way. I've got LG OLEDs around my house and also Samsung's latest technology where they've got their, what they call micro LEDs. Um, however, I certainly have, from previous use and expense of actually plugging in a machine to it, it's very hard to work on a real estate of, you know, 55 or 42 inches. Now, what generally happens is with TVs is if you go for the smaller models, so if you go for, I think the smallest you can now buy is probably a 43, you generally have a lot of those features taken away. So the 120 hertz wouldn't be applicable. You'd only be running 4K at 60. Therefore, it kind of negates the, the, the possibility of going and buying one of those to suffice this need. So... Why do I think the M32U is the best bang for buck and the best gaming monitor, period, at this moment? Well, let's turn this around. Let's flip it around, have a look at the screen and the monitor itself, go through the menu, and I'll kind of talk about what I love about it 
and what particularly could improve in the future, but also how it performs with games. So let's take a bit of a view of the specification, key features, that kind of thing. So you'll see Gigabit, I said this is the world's first KVM gaming monitor. I'm sure it was. They won't made that claim necessarily if it wasn't. Give a bit of a view of that. Like I mentioned, it does have the adaptive sync technology, also AMD FreeSync Premium Pro, and like I mentioned, it does definitely support NVIDIA G-Sync from what I've seen. Doesn't list it here though. Never mind. You can see a little bit about the one for all the KVM side, and it kind of shows you what you can connect in. And yes, I've tested it and it does work flawlessly. And a little bit about the features. So obviously the IPS, what they've said, super speed. So they've got response times of one millisecond. So like I said earlier, you can now get uh, monitors that can certainly outperform others in this function. The UHD 144, which is one of the key options and reasons I bought this. And then the 10 bit color. So again, really good color accuracy and representation. You get a little bit about the sidekick, which I haven't installed. Um, I might look at doing that in a moment and see what, how, how that kind of works. That actually does look quite useful. Um, yeah, I might actually look at that. You've got Game Assist, which enables the HDR mode and various other functionalities. You've got a dashboard. A dashboard reviews your real-time hardware, including that. So again, it's going to be an optional level. You've got the black equalizer, so it adds more punch to the blacks, which does look good. The six axis color controls, and then the sort of auto update. Interesting. I will install the software in a short moment, and here you get the clear sound, which I mentioned later, potentially in this video, about how well the sound comes across. Flicker free and certainly eye safe. And I've mentioned before, I think IPS do have a very, very good response. You get a little bit about the swivel and tilt and then a little bit more about those monitors and the kind of tilt and pan functionality, which I'll be honest, as is very, very good. So let's just scroll back up and look at the specs. So from a specification point of view, this kind of tells you how it's backlit. Also about the display viewing angle, the fact it's a non-glare surface, which does help. The brightness levels, as you can see, is 350 CDM2. Contrast ratio, well, like I said, is not going to be as high as what you'd see on a VA panel. Now this is interesting because when it is saying it's 10-bit, it's not a natural 10-bit, it's actually 8-bit plus FRC which a lot are, to be honest, so I'm not really too worried about that. It's got all the other functionalities, and considering this is a 3-watt, two lots of 3-watt speakers, they don't half have some punch to them. But yeah, um, 140 watts input max, so I've not done a reg registered view of how much it uses. It wouldn't surprise me if when you're fully pushing this out, maybe with a KVM pointed in, then also connected to that device, you wouldn't be using the 440 because you would then. But just for display purposes, I imagine it's probably using around 50 to 60 watts as a general use. It does note here that HDMI 2.1 supports PS5 and Xbox Series X. It says it's enable. It, right, okay. To enable OSD Psychic, it requires a connection between PC or monitor with USB 8 to mail cable, which I do have. So I'm going to install OSD Sidekick and we'll have a look and see what it does. So I've installed OSD Sidekick, it's really simple, you just get it from the Gigabit website. Uh, let's just maybe make this a bit bigger, or I will make it a bit bigger. Um, it comes up with the standard display settings and I can kind of change them from here and it will <coughs> switch between the different presets. So this is no different than me pressing the button, so I thought there's no point in me turning the monitor around to spin it around to see it. Um, but this will change to different kind of colour, contrast, and those settings there. I'll leave it back on standard. But if I wanted to adjust the screen brightness, uh, hopefully it will come through 
yeah you can certainly see it's making a difference on the actual screen whether it will actually represent in osd um or abs sorry i'm not sure but the good thing is about this you can set certain hotkeys so i could set like a refresh rate for the monitor on or off um and then different hotkeys that will actually do that um, if I go into general settings, I can see that I'm currently running on display port. I can set different on-screen display transparency levels, on-screen display times. A little bit about the resolution I'm currently running at and the quick switch of the back to control what I want it to do. The KVM functionality is if I've got something plugged in, I can control from here. And then a little bit about, and I'll have to double check if that is the current version of firmware. But if not, I'll look at ways to update it. But you can see the build date, the model name, whatever. Now, what I like about the fact that you've got these is that it gives you a little bit of functionality to actually do this without having to reach behind a monitor, which, depending on how you've mounted, can be a little bit awkward. And I know a lot of people do criticise sometimes that manufacturers have now started to put these on. But the reason they've done that is obviously to reduce the amount of bezel required around the monitor. So fully understandable. Now, how does this perform in games? Well, I can show you a game, but realistically, all you're going to be seeing is my take of what my 4800 series is actually doing. What I can tell you though, however, is I'm really impressed because obviously it's running at 4K, it's running at 144 hertz therefore i don't generally notice any anti-aliasing or screen tearing going on um, and it does perform very very well so that's kind of my point of this monitor now from a like i said a nits brightness point can i prove that it reaches that 300 mark i don't have a nits reader but i'll be honest my room with the sun and where it faces this does seem very clear and probably better performing than my current MSI monitor which has a higher nit ratio so that probably tells you how far the technology has moved on in the years and this monitor is probably outperforming you know the others or at least visually outperforming whether it is actually from a full brick nightness level it's certainly doing what I expect it to do so there we are, that's my kind of in-depth or semi-in-depth view of the Gigabit M32U gaming monitor. Now, what I will say is, obviously, when you're looking at a 4K gaming monitor with excess of 60 hertz, you are going to start to look at the higher price range. Now, my in particular, I got second hand off eBay for around 549 pound so if we turn that into dollars it's probably not too dissimilar these days so anytime i reference pounds just put a dollar sign instead and you've probably got a realistic or reasonable price you can expect to find that at. now from my point that was quite a good price point for me now if you went to go and buy it today for an rrp price you're probably looking at around the 649 mark that being said, I previously owned a Samsung 49 inch uh, ultra wide before, which cost me somewhere around £1,200. So why have I gone back to 16 by nine? Now I'll be honest, the reason for it is around the games I play. Do many games support, you know, kind of resolution size of 5,000 against 2160, for example? not likely they certainly can and you can certainly play around with uis in you know games to to kind of get the maximum benefit of using an ultra wide but do ultra wise offer you any kind of competitive advantage probably not you know um, fps players may disagree with that i'm not sure i don't generally play a lot of fps games myself i'm more of an rpg and more action-based gamer myself although i do sometimes dabble with fps's but from my perspective, I've always been about having, you know, reaction time, response rate, lag, those kind of things that you're particularly interested in as a gamer represented on the monitor that I'm using. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I did say I would clarify the display port. It is 1.4. 
which is more than enough at this current state. Um, we've not moved on too much from the DisplayPort technology. We certainly will be. Um, you will hear of stuff like DP2 cables. Again, at the moment, until you start getting into 8K gaming, then really that's kind of not needed. Now, I have mine connected via DisplayPort because I generally find DisplayPort 1 represents a PC connectivity better, and I don't need the sound pass-through from it. Because what I've got connected separately on my two HDMI sections is one, the feed from my capture card into the monitor to enable me if I wanted to view what I'm now seeing, I can do that. But also for my Xbox Series X, which can be replaced with my PlayStation 5 at any point in time, I've then got a more than capable gaming monitor. So I suppose you're questioning, what do I do about the sound? Well, the sound itself from this monitor is actually really, really good. Um, now, I'm not, I don't say that with a kind of tongue-in-cheek, I'm taking the mickey. What I'm saying is, is from a gaming monitor or any monitor perspective, speakers normally sound really tinny. This one actually has a bit of oomph to it. Not, not to the point of the kind of setup I've got, where I've got 5.1 um, Logitech system, which I certainly wouldn't replace but enough for just general day-to-day -day use. So if I just wanted to have a quick game of, you know, uh, something where I, I wasn't really bothered about the, the kind of surround or 3.1 or 5.1 or 5.2 or whatever, this would more than suffice. It's got enough punch to it for me to listen to. However, what I have done is utilised the um, headphone socket out. I don't know as yet if it will support more than stereo, which would be an interesting thing for me to kind of cover off I suppose later date but I've utilized a 3.5 jack out into two RCAs to feed into the back of my Logitech system so I'll probably report back in a short while on how that works but that kind of covers all of my needs the final part I had around it was not just as a gaming monitor but how future proof could it be from the KVM perspective, that was a massive, massive, massive draw for me because of the functionality it enables me to have where I can keep stuff separate. I can connect my keyboard and mouse to the back of the monitor and my webcam, and certainly then turn this station into my workstation and with just an unplug of one KVM cable and a click of a switch, go back to my gaming and business workstation. So for me, absolutely phenomenal but most monitors now are starting to really think outside the box now there are additional versions of kvm monitors that you can look at and i've got at home um, another setup which philips and i know hp do now where they have a full kvm thunderbolt docking solution inside the monitor with network pass through as well so if you're looking just primarily for a business solution and then to have a daisy chain monitor for example i know philips certainly support it um, i might do a review of one in the future but philips have got a model where they've got display port out as well so basically from one monitor you can feed a separate one and just plug your you know your sort of device in that way and then feed both monitors so you've got functionality and options there but yeah this is my review of the gigabit m32u and i would say a pound for pound and from a performance point of view, this is, as of today in 2023, what I believe is the best gaming monitor available. So I will hopefully get another one at some point to accompany my main one. But yeah, watch this space. If you have liked what you've seen today, hit the like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.